We begin 2 Corinthians for beginners. This is lesson number one. And we're going to start with a, uh, a review. Um, in, order to, um, in order to understand 2 Corinthians, uh, it is assumed that everyone has read 1 Corinthians, but you can't make those assumptions always. Since there's no guarantee for this, and being familiar with 1 Corinthians is really necessary to understand 2 uh, Corinthians, we're going to begin this class with a short review of Paul's first letter to this particular church. So just some background information, some introductory material this morning, and then as we go on, we'll, we'll go into the, uh, into the text. So let's talk about the, the city itself. Uh, city of Corinth in 146 uh, BC, the Roman uh, general uh, Lucius um, Maminus uh, uh, crushed a Greek bid for independence from Rome by completely destroying the city of Corinth. So it, we begin our, our, <laughs> our look at Corinth by remembering when it was completely destroyed by the Romans. A hundred years later, Julius Caesar sent a colony of veterans and descendants of freedmen to rebuild the city. Um, and uh, in time, uh, the city of Corinth grew to great importance. Uh, it uh, eventually became the fourth largest city in the uh, Roman Empire. It had a population of about 600,000 people and for that time, that was a, an, an, enormous, uh, an enormous city to have that many people. Uh, it was also a city uh, well suited uh, for trade and commerce because of its three seaports and its location on the isthmus between northern and southern uh, Greece. Uh, it became eventually the Roman capital of the Greek district of uh, Achaia. So because of its location, it drew a, a mixed population of Greeks and Romans, Egyptians and Jews, who all came there to, to trade, to do business. Uh, Corinth was a wealthy city given to commerce and art and uh, entertainment. Uh, the Isthmus, that's a hard word to say, I want to tell you, the Isthmus games were held here these were second only to the Olympic Games. The winners received a wreath or a crown made of leaves, actually two kinds, either celery leaves or pine tree leaves. Paul refers to this practice in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, when he says everyone who competes in the games, exercise self-control in all things. So writing to the Corinthians, when he's talking about the games, they understood he was talking about the Isthmus games. They, uh, he says they then do it to receive a perishable wreath, the wreath we just saw, but we an imperishable, imperishable wreath. And so he's talking here about Christians competing for a crown that is imperishable, of course, meaning the, the crown of eternal, eternal life. But that, that reference, that famous passage, based on the experience of the Corinthians and the sport games that they had at that time. Uh, the people there held to uh, many pagan uh, gods and there were many temples and pagan practices that went on. The two main gods, Poseidon, who was the god of the sea. I think I've got a slide for him, there we go. And um, uh, so they had many different gods, Poseidon as I mentioned. It was also the center for worship for uh, Venus, the goddess of love, and there were a thousand temple prostitutes free to strangers. The Corinthians did not know the meaning of morality or chastity or purity. They were an extremely immoral society. The term to Corinthianize meant to prostitute or to desecrate something. So common in the vernacular, you know, or rather their behavior was so well known that it became common in the vernacular of the day 
to use their name when we wanted to refer to something that was not good or, or immoral. The Greek writers of that period said that if even a Corinthian were portrayed in a play, he was always shown as being drunk. So they, never had, they never had a positive image of Corinthians in any of the literature. So the church there was established in Corinth in about 50, 51 AD by Paul when he was on his second missionary journey. He was assisted by Priscilla and Aquila, a couple of Christians who had fled Rome and settled in Corinth. Paul also traveled with Timothy and Silas. You can say Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila was the man, Priscilla the woman. Another worker who helped build the early church there was Apollos, who was taught the gospel more perfectly, if we remember in the book of Acts, by Aquila and Priscilla. So the story of the establishment of the church is found in Acts chapter 18, and instead of summarizing it, it's a pretty good summary, so I thought we'd just read it. After these things, he meaning Paul, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius, Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sincrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and um, reasoned, with the, uh, reasoned with the Jews. A couple of more verses. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to, um, went down to Antioch. So uh, Paul establishes the church there in Corinth. Uh, made up of Jews who have uh, left the synagogue but who face anonymity from, uh, or animosity rather, from their Jewish countrymen for leaving. Uh, everyone, in the, everyone in the early church had somebody against them. There was a price to pay. It wasn't just, a, you know, now I'm a, I used to believe this over here, which nobody cared about anyways, and now I believe this over here, which nobody cares about anyways, which is kind of like what happens to us many times. We, we don't really you know, believe anything. We're not firmly attached to something in particular, and then for some reason uh, begin to read the Bible. Someone shares the gospel with us. We become interested in Christianity. We follow through repent, we're baptized, we begin our growth in, in, in Christ. 
But I mean, nobody burns our house down. We don't lose our jobs because we've become a Christian. If we go to our, uh, you know, to our uh, uh, work uh, mates at work and uh, during a lunch break, uh, so what's going on? And somebody will say, well, I was baptized on Sunday. You know, I, I became a Christian. Well, what do you think the reaction will be? You think people you know, will take their trays and get up and walk away? And, well, no, they'll go, that's nice. You know, <laughs> you know, good for you. Or really, why did you do that? And they kind of, or someone will say, well, I, oh yeah, you were baptized. I remember I was baptized as a young boy you know, in this church or that church. It's not going to be shaking the world. But these people you know, in, the, in, in the first century, they had somebody against them. Every group had something. The Jews, their Jewish family and their Jewish friends and their, their fellow believers rejected them. They abandoned not only their religion, in a sense they were abandoning their own culture. And I'll tell you something, for many people it's much more difficult to be rejected culturally than religiously. Religiously, you know, it's up here, it's in here. Culturally, it's how you eat, who you talk to, the holidays that you keep, going over to, I remember when Lisa and I first became Christians, <clears throat> both of our families, they always plan stuff on Sunday mornings. On Sunday morning, we're all going to go over here. You know? Well, before we used to go, but well, Sunday morning, that's when we, we had services Sunday morning. And we were polite and excused ourselves. You know, we'll catch up you guys later. But her mom and dad lived like 40, 50 miles from our house with the four kids. You know, and we, we never made it for the lunch. Easter Sunday, well, Easter Sunday, in the morning, we, we roll the eggs at lunchtime, the big lunch, everybody's over. Yeah. They didn't understand why I, as a minister, <laughs> couldn't drop everything on Sunday morning and go roll the eggs and be there for dinner. After all, the family was all there, why can't you be there? And believe me, that's just a small thing in comparison to some of these the people here in the, in the Corinthian church, the, 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 the Jews suffer terribly for having abandoned their religion and for many it seemed their own culture. Very difficult. Uh, the Greeks uh, had a background in sexual immorality and paganism. For them it was very difficult to completely, you know, to change. At least for the Jews, their, uh, their, mo their moral standing was similar you know, as they became Christians. They didn't have to become more or less moral as Christians. The standards is what I'm trying to get at. The standard for morality and personal conduct as a Jew was similar to the standard of personal conduct and mor morality for a Christian. But for a Greek, oh boy, that was a real life change because of the lifestyle. Uh, most of the people were poor and were from the lower ranks of society. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 26. So uh, there were great social, cultural, and religious differences, never mind between the Christians and what they had left behind, but between the Christians themselves. If you had grown up as a Jew, your whole life you had been taught not to associate with Gentiles. In its most extreme form, you know, if a Gentile was coming your way, you would cross the street so their shadow would not intersect with your shadow. And now, what were you supposed to do? You were sitting right next to them. They were touching you. <laughs> you were breaking the loaf and you were eating from the same loaf at communion. You were calling each other brother, sister. We read in Romans you know, where Paul says, greet each other with a, a holy kiss, right? Of course, in those days that meant the women 
kiss the women. The men kiss the men. There was no the men kiss the women as many times we do here in a, in a, in a, in a greeting, in a friendly greeting. But can you imagine a Jew who had grown up in the Jewish religion greet each other with a holy kiss? Oh, I have to demonstrate physical affection to the one that I... <laughs> so they had a great challenge in these churches, especially 1 Corinthians as a model church. Paul, uh, as Acts tells us, supported himself in his work by working with Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent making, little research, if you dig down deep, tent making, not necessarily the canvas, but it, they, they made the, uh, the leather, there was a leather spot there in the tent where the loop would go through to tie it down. They were kind of leather workers, okay? So he worked with them, and this is an important point to remember, that he worked with them, that he earned his own living for a time. That's important to remember when we get into the text of 2 Corinthians. The Greeks had great pride in their intellectualism and their oratory powers. They also were argumentative and clannish. All information we get from 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 First Corinthians doesn't describe the Jews much, but we already know how self-righteous and legalistic and bigoted they were. So this church faced serious unity problems, putting all these people in the same church. We also know that they usually met in homes, public halls or schools, whenever it was safe to do so, usually in secret. Church buildings you know, that were erected strictly for church meetings, that doesn't happen till around the second century. So we don't know how big the church was. Interesting, isn't it? We know how large the, the church was in Jerusalem at the beginning, thousands and thousands of people. You know, Paul, uh, Luke writes about the, the church in Acts, 3,000 and 5,000, so on and so forth. But after those numbers, there isn't any church where we're given their number. We have no idea how big the church at Ephesus was. We have no idea how big the church at Corinth was or Berea. We have no ideas. We get no numbers. They could have been a thousand or they could have been a hundred. So the letter of 1 Corinthians was probably written in the winter of 54 to 57 AD, roughly three to five years after the church in Corinth was established. Paul had been with the, them initially for about 18 months, which was a long time for him. He didn't usually stay that long in one place. So this means that he's now been away from Corinth. In other words, if it was written three to five years after the church was established, it means he was there for about 18 months or so, and he's been gone for several years. So at the time of writing, Paul was in Ephesus. We know that, 1 Corinthians 16, 15 to 18. And several events moved Paul to write this letter to this particular church. First of all, he had received a report about the affairs of the church from Clo's family, who were members of the church. He had also received a letter from the church asking him questions. That's why 1 Corinthians is such a great epistle because it answers so many questions about you know, normal church activity. Well, <laughs> normal and abnormal church activity. Um, he had urged Apollos to go and help them resolve their problems, but Apollos had declined. I always find that so fascinating. Here's a servant of the church, Apollos, all spoken well of by Paul and others. And Paul says, you know, I'd like for you to go there and do this. And he says, you know what, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy, he said, I can't do it. Isn't that like real life? Doesn't that happen in ministry? It's not a fairy tale. People are busy, people have stuff to do, even quote ministers. He was busy, not now, he said, I'll go, but not now. He had received news, Paul did, had received news from several brethren from Corinth who had brought him a gift 
from that particular congregation. A gift for his birthday? No, a gift. He had to eat. He needed support. Like many, many ministries, missionaries, they raise support so that they can continue working. Same thing here. A couple of interesting facts about 1 Corinthians. Next to Romans, it is Paul's longest letter. It's also the most varied in content. A lot of the letters that you read from Paul have a kind of you know, one particular theme. Uh, Colossians, for example, you know, that Jesus Christ is God. He is the divine savior. And that letter really focuses. First Corinthians is you know, lots of different subjects in it. Uh, the letter also contains the strongest rebukes against individuals and groups. And uh, this was actually, First Corinthians, now here you have to kind of have some mind games to hold all this in. This was actually the second letter that he had written to them. We learn that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. But the first letter was lost and we have no record of it. So we're reading a letter entitled 1 Corinthians and we find out that 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul had written to these people, the first one being lost. So 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter. 2 Corinthians is actually the third letter. All right, so try to keep that in mind. 1 Corinthians probably gives us the, the clearest picture of life and problems of the local church in the Gentile world in the first century. Best letter to give us, of, uh, give us a view of this. Um, the concern of 1 Corinthians was not doctrine or theology, who is God, or the nature of salvation, or when will the end of the world come, or you know, what will happen at the end of, you know, it's, not, it's not concerned with, uh, with doctrine. It's concerned with pastoral theology. How should Christians act? How should we treat one another? How should we you know, conduct ourselves to make a, a good witness? Uh, these people here were weak, immature, divisive Christians who needed a mature leader to show them how and why to lead a Christian life in the, in the proper way. The complication was that they were also a very gifted church. They had powerful spiritual gifts. Well, some in the congregation had powerful spiritual gifts, but they were using them improperly. So the letter is divided into a discussion of nine vital concerns for this church and uh, you know, Paul tacks on an, an introduction. So you've got the introduction and then the, the, the vital concerns that he talks about. Remember I said varied topics. So concerning division, concerning leadership, concerning immorality, concerning marriage, concerning freedom, worship, concerning gifts, the proper use of gifts, concerning resurrection, and then concerning the collection, financial support of the church. This is 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. So like a good elder, he shepherds the confused and the disobedient. This church had plenty of both by teaching them what the Lord requires in different areas of Christian life. What does Jesus, you know, the, the people used to wear that yellow band there, what would Jesus do? Well, this is almost like a what would Jesus do letter. What would Jesus do if he had these spiritual gifts? Well, if, you know, with these spiritual gifts. What would Jesus do to worship? How would he worship? So on and so forth. Now, there's no absolute agreement about the order of these events, but something resembling this occurred between the writing of the first letter, 1 Corinthians we're talking about here, and the second one that Paul writes to these brethren. So the Corinthians received the first letter. Okay, this letter here we're talking about, 1 Corinthians. They received this letter and they take care of most of the problems that are mentioned in this letter. Now certain Jews come into the church and they begin to stir up trouble which makes necessary Paul's visit that he talks about in chapter 2 verse 1. 
This would now be his third visit to these people. These people were doing several things. These people, when I'm talking about these people, I'm not talking about the Corinthians, I'm talking about the Jews, Jewish Christians who had come into the church and began teaching and stirring up trouble. And the type of things that they were doing, for example, they were presenting themselves as apostles. Like Peter was an apostle, or Paul was an apostle, or they were presenting themselves as apostles. They were stirring up strife and division in the church. They were criticizing Paul and they were challenging his authority. If you want to divide a church, don't go to the members and stir them up. I mean, that helps. No, 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 no. Go straight to the top. Start with a division among the elders. You have two elders, get those two elders to argue with each other. You have five elders, get three of them to really begin a, a, a campaign or a war against the other two elders. That's, you know, if you can divide the eldership, dividing the congregation, well, that's easy after that. So that's what they were doing. They were going not after the leaders in the local congregation, they were going after Paul the one who had planted that church. And they were questioning his authority, his teaching. Really, this Paul, really? You're listening to him? He's not even here. They tried to build up a following for themselves among established churches, uh, but they were not evangelistic. They taught circumcision was necessary for salvation. They also had to keep ceremonial laws. In other words, they weren't going out to try to you know, convert people who didn't know the gospel. No, no, they were coming in to people who are already Christians and trying to get them to follow their personal leadership. And they also criticized Paul for receiving money for his work. You know that gift that the Corinthians sent? This was a subject of their criticism. And in the church, people are very sensitive about money how it's spent, who gets it, how much they get. So this is important to note because Paul refers to all of these accusations in 2 Corinthians. So the problems were resolved, resolved rather. Jewish teachers come in, begin stirring up trouble. Paul had written 1 Corinthians from Ephesus and then he left Ephesus to travel to Macedonia in order to collect money for the churches there. We read about that in chapter two and chapter eight. During this trip, he falls ill. So what I'm giving you here is a timeline of events and these are important if you're going to understand the accusations and the arguments in 2 Corinthians. So he falls ill. During this time, Titus arrives in Macedonia and gives Paul a report of the effect of his first letter to the Corinthians. So he's traveling, Titus comes and hey, you know that letter you sent, 1 Corinthians, that letter? Let me tell you how the church reacted to that. On hearing of new problems, what were the new problems? Well, the new problems were the Jews coming in. It wasn't bad enough that they were you know, using their spiritual gifts improperly. It wasn't bad enough that a man was having sex with his, uh, his mother, his stepmother. Uh, it wasn't bad enough those things were taking place that he'd written about in 1 Corinthians. No, no, now these, these Jews come in and start causing trouble. And this is what Titus tells him. So he writes 2 Corinthians and he gives it to Titus and says, all right, go on back, bring this letter back to them. Later, Paul will visit Corinth again for a few months and during this time will write the letter to the Romans and perhaps also the one to the Galatians. We know about that in Acts chapter 20, verse two and three. And then his stay at Corinth will be short-lived as a plot will be formed against him and he will have to escape by changing his plans. Now, this is church stuff going on. 
not just a plot to uh, denounce him or to undermine his teaching. No, no, these guys, they, they played hardball. We don't like you, we want to get rid of you, we want to take over your position, so we're going to kill you. <laughs> not enough to destroy your reputation. No, no, we, we just want to take you out. So during this time, we see Paul's work as an apostle include the very real tasks of caring for the needy, you know, the collection that he was taking, he was gathering money to help the needy in different churches. He was also teaching in person and through his epistles. He was mentoring and training, Titus for example, mentoring and training that young evangelist. He was resolving disputes and divisions. Second Corinthians was written for that purpose. And he was preaching and planting churches, Macedonia and Corinth. So 2 Corinthians uh, is, is, is an epistle that talks about the life of an apostle. Whereas 1 Corinthians is aimed at the members. And when we study 1 Corinthians, what we're studying is you know, similar problems that we have today. Division, pride, immoral behavior, that stuff keeps going generation after generation. And so 1 Corinthians is very helpful because it addresses the same problems that continue from generation to generation. 2 Corinthians, however, is fascinating because it gives you insight into the apostle, the work of the apostle. What is it like, or what was it like, to be one of Jesus' apostles in the first century? So 2 Corinthians is a subjective book, unlike 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians teaches the church how to do things and what to think about things and how to conduct yourself and so on and so forth. Second Corinthian reveals what it is like to be an apostle. So the book is centered around Paul's experience as an apostle. And second Corinthians can be outlined in the following way. There's a brief uh, introduction and then it's all about being an apostle. The apostolic experience, the apostolic explanation, the apostolic ministry, the apostolic fellowship, and then uh, apostolic defense, defense of his apostleship. Imagine, imagine what it's like to have seen Jesus, heard Jesus, to, to have been called in a miraculous way, to have performed miracles, to have written material given to you by God, to have been beaten and flogged and imprisoned and robbed and you know, all manner of, of trial and difficulty in your life, having given everything to your ministry. Imagine, and then people come along and say, well, you're no apostle. Prove to us that you're an apostle. Who says you're an apostle? Could you imagine? I mean, I, I think I would just melt in rage. <laughs> if it were me, I would just melt, just like butter in the microwave. And yet, we see the true apostolic spirit in 2 Corinthians, a fascinating, fascinating, very personal uh, epistle, more personal than any other epistle than, that he wrote. There are always sections in different epistles where Paul reveals himself, talks about himself a little bit, but 2 Corinthians is really an appeal uh, to understand what it's like to be um, an apostle. Okay, so there's our, our little introduction. So we have some background material. I give you the dreaded assignment. Uh, read 1 Corinthians. If you're a daily Bible reader, you know, put, up, put up your schedule there if you can manage it, put that aside or add to it. Read through 1 Corinthians, get familiar with the scene and then 2 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, verses 1 to 11, that's the material we're going to be covering uh, next Sunday. So I thank you for your 
attention. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. All right, God bless you. We'll see you next time.